Chapter 10, A Democratic Revolution, 1800-1844. So we are still leading up to our civil war that's coming. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the first half of the 19th century is all about that uh, that event and the and relations between North and South kind of coming apart, okay? So you have this new style of government in America, a republic. And this is a democratic revolution. Uh, people worldwide are still fascinated with what's going on in the United States. Freedom, liberty, the entirety of Europe wished it were they. But there are also criticisms and insults. While the system was impressive and agreeable, the people were another story. Uh, I mentioned before, Americans always seem to be turning away from copying any European government or culture. Uh, they had a disdain for people of privilege, monarch, succession by bloodline, all, all these European type of, of issues. Uh, so this gave them a reputation of being rough around the edges, especially to Europeans. Okay, This is from the intro uh, page of your chapter. The gentleman spit, talk of elections, and the price of produce, and spit again. Party politicians reek of whiskey and onions. Europeans believed politicians in America were of low intellect. They felt the New York Assembly was a bunch of farmers, shopkeepers, and country lawyers. Uh, so Americans were looked at by Europeans as unsophisticated and crass. Okay. So this is the idea of the democratic Revolution, a competitive contest for the votes of the common man and later women. And it's somewhat like what we have today. It, it's, you know, votes today, elections are very much like a, like a popularity contest. So the Democratic Revolution is the, is the uh, title of our chapter, and that's what we'll be talking about here. So the rise of the rabble, the unwashed, the common man. <clears throat> and this will come to a zenith when Andrew Jackson becomes president. And we've talked about... Jackson in the past in the War of 1812 and his uh, Battle of New Orleans. Uh, so he he becomes very popular for that, a military hero. He will rise to the presidency. Uh, but the, the Europeans are looking at this American experiment as a nice thing, but a rootless, classless people. This is also the era of the second party system. So we talked about the first party system was Hamilton versus Jefferson. They will be replaced by Jackson versus Henry Clay and the Whig Party, okay? Uh, 1828, 1856, uh, the Democrats headed by Andrew Jackson, the Whigs headed by Henry Clay. So this new era challenged the old hierarchical system, and this idea of a party system continued. The, the founding fathers were gone. Uh, the Federalists were gone. So there was really nobody left to argue against the, the party system anymore, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. The 1824 election would mark the final collapse of the Republican versus Federalist political framework and first party system. Uh, so after after saying how America became a two party system in 1824, there was only one party. Uh, the only time uh, no candidate ran as a Federalist. Five significant candidates all competed as Democratic Republicans. So clearly. Although I've made a point about how this two-party system developed in 1824, no no party system functioned. Okay, um, I want you to take a break here and watch a couple of films. Uh, and this is about the electoral college. Okay, so this is important because this 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 has to do with the election of 1824. So in America, we don't we don't elect the president by a popular vote. We elect the president by the Electoral College. So, what does that mean? Each state has senators and representatives, and whatever that, whatever the number of that is, is is the number of your electoral votes. So, California's got fifty something electoral votes, and South Dakota might have three because the population is so much smaller there. Okay, so this is why presidents campaign for specific states to to, to get those electoral votes. So, is it possible to win the electoral vote? And lose the election. Well, you'll see in 1824 this happens, but this also happened in eight, uh, uh, not 18, 2016. Recently, Hillary Clinton uh, won nearly three million more popular votes than Donald Trump, but he won the election. Okay. 
So these two films I want you to watch are about the Electoral College. The first one is called Does Your Vote Count? The Electoral College Explained. And that is kind of a more of a modern day look at it, okay, how it works. And then, and then watch the one called Pro-Slavery, Origin of the Electoral College. And that kind of argues that the Electoral College is a legacy to the days of slavery. So please go ahead and watch those two um, films. Okay, so let's look at this <clears throat> election of 1824. Okay, so uh, the winner of the Electoral College was Andrew Jackson with 99 votes. John Quincy Adams received 84. Okay, uh, although Jackson seemed to have won a narrow victory, he was not named president. Okay, um, and this is where, where a man named Henry Clay comes into, into play here. And we'll be talking a lot about Henry Clay. <clears throat> Henry Clay coveted the presidency and would, and would make many uh, unsuccessful attempts to become the president between 1824 and 1848, I believe seven elections, but never elected. Okay. Uh, so what happens when, when uh, uh, nobody's named president? Uh, uh, Jackson wins the electoral college, but not the majority. He gets 99 votes. John Quincy Adams gets 84. So although it seemed like he wins, Jackson's not named president because you don't have a majority. You have to have a majority to 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 win. Okay, so what happens when you don't when someone does not get a majority? The House of Representatives it, it is has to choose between the top two candidates. So the election is thrown to the House of Representatives. So Henry Clay at that time <clears throat> was the Speaker of the House. Okay, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, a very decisive position. Now, Henry Clay did not like Jackson at all. Jackson was one of those types of people, perhaps like Donald Trump, that you either loved him or you hated him. <clears throat> okay, so, so Clay had led some of the strongest attacks against Jackson in the campaign. And he would do anything in his power rather than see the nation's top office go to a man that he detested. So Clay of Kentucky built an Ohio Valley and New England coalition. And, and and got these these representatives together to 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 and persuade them to vote against Jackson. <clears throat> so this secured the White House for John Quincy Adams. Uh, this of course makes uh, makes uh, Jackson incensed. Okay, so in return for then this is key. Adams names Clay as his Secretary of State. So it appears like. Clay <clears throat> makes a bargain with Adams. I'll I'll throw the presidency to you, but you make me your Secretary of State. Why would he want that? Well, the Secretary of State uh, was a position that had been the stepping stone to the presidency for the previous four executives. It still is a very important position today. And like I said before, Clay coveted the presidency, so he he figures if I become Secretary of State. The next time, you know, I, I will become president. So this was denounced immediately by Jackson <clears throat> as a corrupt bargain. Uh, you know, you you uh, uh, you used your influence to help John Quincy win. So uh, Jackson supporters claimed that Adams and Clay worked together to steal the election from Jackson, and they called it a corrupt bargain. Despite their claims, the vote in the House declared John Quincy Adams the sixth president of the United States. So so Jackson gets kind of you know, uh, maneuvered out of out of the presidency, the, the presidency that probably should have gone to him. Okay, so the antagonistic presidential race of 1828—that's four years later—began practically before Adams took office in 1824. Jackson is intent. Um, I've just been screwed here, and I'm I'm coming back with a vengeance. I'm going to win the election in four years. I'm going to start right now. Okay. Uh, to, to Jacksonians, Jackson, supporters of Jackson, the Adams Clay Alliance symbolized a corrupt system where elite insiders pursued their own interests uh, without heeding the will of the people. Okay. Uh, so, so Jackson presents himself as the champion of the common man, and this is what he's known for. Uh, you know, un unlike Adams, who, whose father had been a Federalist and, and he was somewhat of a, of a privileged uh, person. Uh, so you have this, you have these four tumultuous years with Adams as president. And of course, when the election of 1828 comes around, Adams is going to run for re-election. Uh, 
and of course Jackson is there to run against him. Uh, Jackson's support came from the West and South, Adams from the North, New England. Okay, uh, so this this election is significant because it 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 marks a profound change when you elect a man widely viewed as the champion of the common people. Uh, but the election was also no noteworthy for the intense personal attacks by the supporters of both candidates. So it's it's take two. You've done this before. The incumbent John Quincy Adams versus Andrew Jackson were total opposites. I, I, again, Adams is a highly educated son of the nation's second president, widely traveled as a diplomat. Uh, John Quincy, I'm sorry, Jackson was an orphan who clawed his way to success along the frontier before becoming a national hero at the Battle of New Orleans. Remember that battle that was fought during the War of 1812 that came after the treaty had already been signed. Uh, Adams was known for his thoughtful introspection. Jackson had a reputation for being violent, having violent encounters, and actually uh, participating in a, in a couple of duels. Both had had long careers of public service. Both men had wild stories circulated about their pasts. Charges of murder, adultery, womanizing were plastered across the pages of partisan newspapers. So this was this was take two. They'd faced each other before. We just talked about the election of 1824, the corrupt bargain where it was believed that Clay cut a deal with Adams to become the Secretary of State. And like I said, Jackson's campaign against Adams began immediately after that election was over in 1824. Uh, Jackson and his supporters worked diligently to line up support around the country. So, so both camps undermined the character of their opponents. They, they had strong differences on substantial issues. Uh, the 1828 election was a return to a two-party system. So that, that one election of one party was over 1824. Adams as a national Republican, Jackson as a Democrat. And the careers of both candidates became fodder for attacks. For those against Andrew Jackson, there was a gold mine of material. Jackson was famed for his hot temper and had led a life filled with violence and controversy and, like I said, had taken part in several duels. Uh, even his marriage was, was brought into the fray, uh, became material for campaign attacks. Uh, when Jackson first met his wife, Rachel, she mistakenly believed her first husband, whom she had married as a teenager, had divorced her. So when Jackson married her in 1791, they didn't realize it, but she was still actually married. Of course, this is against the law. You can't be married to two people at one time. This makes you a bigamist. Of course, they, they realized, and the courts realized that it was a mistake, and it was eventually resolved, and they remarried in 1794 to ensure that their marriage was legal. Uh, but Jackson's political opponents knew of the confusion, so his marriage of nearly 40 years became a major issue. And he was accused of adultery for running off with another man's wife, and his wife was accused of bigamy. So a personal attack against a man's wife, and Jackson was not very thrilled about this. Uh, there are also many attacks on John Quincy Adams. He, they opposed him uh, for being an elitist, you know, they, you're like your father, you're, you're, you have refinement, intelligence, and, and you're, you're nerdy and, and, and bookish, and they turn this against him, and uh, so you've, you've got a lot of mudslinging going on here, and, and Adams being the person that he was, uh, recoiled, he, he refused to get involved with the campaign tactics, he was so offended by, by, by the campaign, he even refused refused to write in his diary one of his passions. So from 18, I'm sorry, from August of 1828 until after the election, he stops writing his diary. He's so he's so disgusted with the election. But Jackson jumps in and participates. He's so furious about the attacks on himself and his wife that he gets more involved. And he wrote to newspaper editors giving them guidelines on how attacks should be countered and how their own attacks should proceed. So so Adams pulls back and Jackson pushes forward, and this results in Jackson winning the election. Uh, he wins the election of 1828, becomes the seventh president, a slave owner, 
uh, as I mentioned before, also a slave trader, making the making the fifth of the first seven presidents slave owners. Only both the Adams were not slave owners. So Jackson's appeal to the common folk, the common man, served him well, and he, and he handily won both the popular vote and the electoral vote. It came at a very steep price, however. His wife, Rachel, suffered a heart attack and died right before his inauguration. <clears throat> and Jackson, for the rest of his life, always blamed his political enemies for her death. Uh, when Jackson arrived in Washington for his inauguration, he refused to pay the customary courtesy call on the outgoing president, uh, Adams, and Adams reciprocated by refusing to attend the inauguration of Jackson. Uh, you know, the, the inauguration ceremony in America is, is really a way to show the world that the transfer of power in America happens peacefully. There, there's, no, there's no politics. There's no, uh, you know, uh, problem. I, I was the president. Now I'm not. So I'm, I pass the baton to you. Welcome to the White House. Come on. And it's, just, it's a ceremony to show the world that, look, we don't have a problem with this. We can transfer power easily. Uh, but it doesn't happen here. So the bitterness of this 1828 election would resonate for years, okay? So Jackson comes in, seventh president, first generation American, son of Irish immigrant, comes from a very low station on this, on this social hierarchy. The Irish were considered to be members of the lowest class in those days. So, so Jackson was forced to work hard to advance socially and politically. <clears throat> His actions during the War of 1812, especially his overwhelming victory at the Battle of New Orleans in, the, in, the, uh, in 1815, made him a national hero. He's sometimes considered to be the first modern president because he expanded the role from a mere executive to an, to an active participant and representative of the people. But his Indian removal policies, and we, we have been looking at this, uh, the, the film, our film reflection number three, Trail of Tears, and we, we, we know about this, <clears throat> and his unwillingness to consider any opinions but his own, as well as going against a Supreme Court ruling, has tarnished his rep reputation today. <clears throat> 50, 40 years ago, we looked back at Jackson as a hero. He's on the $20 bill. Today, we don't necessarily look back and see him like that. His... His legacy has been tarnished, much like Jefferson, like Columbus. Jackson is, is another one, okay? Uh, but he enters office determined to end government corruption and the nation's financial difficulties, caused in his mind by the upper class <clears throat> elite in government, business, and finance, okay? So let's go ahead and take another break here and watch the next <clears throat> film. This is called American Presidents, Andrew Jackson's Seventh U.S. President. <clears throat> Please watch that film and come on back. Okay, so so his policy towards Native Americans is well known, and and this, like I said, tarnishes his legacy. Uh, Native Americans were being pushed further west during Western expansion. Jackson believed the backbone of the American economy in the future was small family farms, the the, the Jeffersonian idyllic point of view. Small independent farms that, that are self-sufficient can take care of ourselves. Jackson believed that the small independent family farm would maintain strong growth and, and this would cause the population to increase. So you need new farmland to do this. OK, uh, so he comes up with the Indian Removal Act of 1830. This is passed and this is used to force the removal of Native Americans, force them from the south to the west. And this would happen throughout his presidency. And this, the whole idea is to open up this fertile land that was formerly Native American in the South. So the Deep South states, Georgia, uh, mostly uh, parts of Alabama and so on um, is what we're talking about. But the, the, those Deep South states where cotton will boom after this removal is done. Uh, uh, Jackson wants to get rid of the natives so he can he can bring in a, in a you know cotton plantations. OK. <clears throat> So you so you uh, you remove the natives to create an opportunity for white settlement. They are pushed out. This causes the Trail of Tears, which our film reflection number three is about. Okay. So, so we talked about modern historians in the past who who seek to give a voice to the oppressed people in American history. They've been hard on Jackson. 
His removal policies were unconstitutional. He ignored his Supreme Court ruling to stop. He's accused of ethnic cleansing. Uh, modern day Native Americans speak out about his crimes and they call him a leader of a genocide against their people. Uh, awareness has been learned about Jackson and his policies, and, you know, by, by modern historians bringing this evidence to light. Uh, so this is definitely rewritten history about Jackson that is not in his favor. And you've had this controversy about, about this bill. Could Andrew Jackson be taken off the $20 bill? Well, in fact, he has been taken off the $20 bill, and he's being replaced by Harriet Tubman. So we're going to talk more about Harriet Tubman, but Harriet Tubman was a woman a, a, who, was, who escaped from slavery and then went back um, 19 times to bring people out herself. So going goes to, to great risk to go back into the South and bring people back out. <clears throat> okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, so Jackson's accused of stealing this land um, and creating this trail of tears because he wants fertile land for for these, for this new opportunity for white Americans, uh, and, it's, and it's it's believed by many that he stole the land, and this was used to expand the cotton farming industry and, of course, slavery, uh, to expand the society and culture that promoted white supremacy. So initially, the Indian Removal Act only narrowly passed Congress, narrowly passed, but then in 1832, Supreme Supreme Court ruling declared it unconstitutional. But as I said, Jackson ignored that decision. <clears throat> 1838, Ralph Waldo Emerson, a very famous American author, wrote a passionate letter calling Jackson's policies a crime that really deprives us, as well as the Cherokees, of a country. <clears throat> For how could we call the conspiracy that should, should crush these poor Indians our government or the land that was cursed by their parting and dying imprecations our country and eat more? So even in those in these times, you have people that are against what he's doing. Okay, so so based on this, the contemporary Native American community has called for him to be removed from the twenty dollar bill. Uh, now, yeah, this has happened. I don't think the government would say that's the reason why it happened, but without with certainty, the pressure from the Native American community had something to do with it. Okay. And the Native American community is very happy about this. And, and people argue, well, you know, don't you have, don't, aren't there, aren't there more important things for you to to, to work on? Your your community has many challenges. Uh, <clears throat> you know why why worry about the twenty dollar bill? Um, yeah, you know, Jackson's image in the twenty dollar bill doesn't compare to, to to the the great challenge that your people have. But don't you think and don't you believe that by confronting and correcting the symbols of our violent and racist histories, and this is an easy fix. Just take him off and put it on somebody else, and and it, it's a step it's a step forward, right? You're you're uh, you're getting rid of a of a of a of a symbol or an image of a person that many people feel is racist and and a, a leader of genocide. Uh, by confronting and correcting the symbols of our violent and racist histories, we prompt conversations about how that legacy continues and how that affects marginalized communities today. There, there's, there, there's other issues there that are in this ballpark. What about the Washington Redskins, the National Football League team, and their insulting name and logo? Is this a similar issue? And many people would say there's, there's bigger problems in the world than that. This typically comes from white people. Uh, but, you know, what, what do they know about being marginalized? Uh, and maybe there are bigger problems in American society and culture to focus on. But isn't it true? Or do you agree that an easy fix should always be done? Take Jackson off the off the twenty dollar bill that that takes that that caricature away, uh, force this team to change their 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 uh, logo and their team name. I mean. This is pretty insulting. Many people will say, oh, we've we've polled Native American communities and they're fine with that. I, I disagree with that. I, I want to see those statistics. I've never spoken to a Native American person in my life that is not insulted by this team. OK. Uh, so it doesn't take much thought. You know, how hard is it to take someone off a dollar, a twenty dollar bill? Uh, and it, initially they talked about Frederick Douglass to take his place. What kind of statement would that make to the African-American community? 
Uh, the reason why they're going with Harriet Tubman, and I'm gonna, you're going to see a couple films here in a, in a minute to, to explain all this. Uh, the, they're changing the bills and moving towards kind of women's rights and civil rights in, 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 in uh, commemoration of the 100-year anniversary of women getting the vote in 2020, okay? Uh, okay, so, so this is the issue, okay? Uh, many, Amer many Native Americans believe a $20 bill is the same as carding the around an image of a serial killer. Many refuse to carry these bills because of what the man brought upon their people. Uh, did Andrew Jackson engineer a genocide? Should he be on our currency or not? What do you think? So let's go ahead and take our next break and watch two films again back to back. The first one is called Native Americans Applaud Andrew Jackson Removal. And then watch the film entitled How Harriet Tubman Kicked Andrew Jackson Off the Front of Your $20 Bill. So an interesting idea when you first when you watch this first film, uh, this is this is an interview with the chief of the Cherokee Nation. So you might be you might be surprised about what this man looks like and what he sounds like. So perhaps we're racially profiling a little bit here, but it, you might be surprised, you know, at, at who this person is, okay? So go ahead and watch those two films and then come on back. Okay, so is Jackson just a bad guy? Um, let's let's be fair. We try to be fair. He had a tough climb out of an impoverished beginning. He was born two weeks after his father's death to a widowed immigrant mother, an Irish immigrant, the lowest of the low in those days. Uh, Jackson was famous for fighting a British officer during the American Revolution. He was very young, but he, he, was, uh, he and his family were taken under the control of some British officers, and the British officers demanded that Jackson shine his boots. Jack, Jackson, as a teenager, or even, even younger than that perhaps, said no. So the officer, uh, you know, sliced him with his sword and permanently scarred his face and hands. So it's kind of like he had this, he had kind of had this badge of courage, this scar on his face that he got in the revolution. <clears throat> so despite his poverty and lack of education, he managed to reach the highest office in the land. That's a powerful story and very American, rags to riches. I mean, America eats this stuff up. So Jackson's a self-made man. Remember we talked about the self-made man? Uh, symbol of the working class, no education, uh, was against the rich, uh, and so on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so is the more precise telling, is this the more precise telling of how Jackson climbed the American socioeconomic ladder? <clears throat> he deserves, der deserves credit too, right? What do you think? Uh, Jackson's legacy opened the door for Americans from all economic backgrounds to participate in politics. <clears throat> he brings in the air of the common man. Opportunities for all, regardless of your social station. And for that, he deserves credit, right? But history is always whitewashed. The Jacksonian democracy as a heroic era and a hero and heroic man, but not anymore. We, we are uh, definitely going to expose these kind of things. And this is one of this is a person that's affected by it. Uh, you know, you Native Americans despise this man and there's good reason. OK. Okay, let's change directions and talk about class, culture, and the second party system and the rise of the Whig Party. With major political parties active in the period between 1834 and 1854, they promote a program of national development. But as you'll see, they, they would founder on the rising tide of sectional antagonism and the separation between North and South. So the Whig Party brought together a loose coalition of groups united in their opposition to what party members viewed as King Andrew Jackson. Uh, the Whig Party came into being to oppose Jackson, much like the Jefferson and the Anti-Federalists came into being to oppose the Federalists. This is the same kind of situation. So the name Whig was borrowed from the British party that, that was opposed to, to uh, royal privilege, okay? Uh, the Whig Party endorsed a country run by wealthy men with abilities, but wanted an elite that was based on talent, not birth. So not the European model where it was inherited. Uh, 
uh, they advocated for the self-made man, which is interesting because the person that they hated the most, Jackson, was a self-made man. So again, another quote from R Ralph Waldo Emerson. Emerson's an important figure in this era, and we'll talk about him more in the next chapter. Of the two great parties, the Democrats have the best cause for free trade, for wide suffrage, but the Whig Party has the best men. Uh, they believe that Jack Jackson violated the Constitution by creating a spoiled system. Uh, to the victor belongs to spoil, and this idea that Jackson brought in all of his cronies. So they called him a king and, and accu accused him of a power more absolute than that of any monarch in Europe in a country that detested European monarchy. So the Whig leaders were Henry Clay and John Calhoun, okay, um, as well as others, Daniel Webster. Um, in, in, in this era, you, you have the fall of the National Republican Party and the rise of the Whigs. <clears throat> the National Republicans become Whigs, 1820. Uh, so this is, this is where these... these the party split again, okay? Uh, Jackson destroyed the National Republican Party with his victories in 1828 and 1832 and put an end to them. Uh, Jackson's victory, you know, uh, caused Henry Clay to bring together fiscal conservatives and Southern states' rights proponents, bring them together, and out of that came this new party, the Whigs. But, you know, again, uh, allied almost exclusively by their common dislike of Jackson and his policies, but Clay also by hunger for, for the office. Uh, so in 1836, the Whigs ran three presidential candidates uh, to appeal to the East, South, and West in an attempt to throw the election into the House of Representatives, like, it ha like what had happened in 1824. Um, <clears throat> But Jackson endorsed the man that had done so much to get him elected in 1824, Martin Van Buren. Martin was opposed to Whig policy, uh, and, he, and he believes that the government is best which governs least. Uh, considered him the, himself a defender of individual rights, and he continued the policy of his predecessor, Andrew Jackson. So Van Buren wins in 1836. But quickly, he becomes known as Martin Van Ruin. It turned out Van Buren was better at acquiring presidential power for Jackson than using it for himself. Uh, he's, he had served as Jackson's Secretary of State, Vice President, and close advisor. And he saw the financial problems beginning even before he entered the White House, and he inherited Andrew Jackson's financial policies, which many believe contributed to what became to be the Panic of 1837, this depression. This, this was the worst economic depression America had <clears throat> yet known. Uh, this is always a, you know, a, a tough thing to get through. Uh, but his reckless policies didn't help. So even with, with the nation in economic crisis, Van Buren stuck to the political philosophies of Jefferson and Jackson, uh, that being that the federal government should exercise only limited power. Uh, he refused to listen to those who said the federal government needs to step in and sta try to stabilize and take control of the nation's failing economy through a new bank of the United States. <clears throat> and he doesn't do that, so people blame him for it, okay? So the following election, 1840, you've got Martin Van Buren versus a new person, William Henry Harrison. We've talked about him in the past. He's the person that led the uh, Battle of Tippecanoe against Prophetstown and Tecumseh and his, and his uh, brother, the prophet Tenskwatawa. So the two party systems firmly entrenched in the 1840s. Uh, the Whigs are trying to unseat the incumbent Democrats. Clay is still trying to be elected. <clears throat> in, in Harrison, the, the Whigs believe that they had found a new Andrew Jackson, attractive as a war hero, frontiersman, uh, and then to pull in Southern Democrats, they nominated John Tyler of Virginia for vice president. Uh, so Harrison wins the nomination for the Whigs. The Democratic National Convention re-nominated Van Buren. But the Whigs capitalize on the country's depressed economic state, and they emphasize Harrison's simple lifestyle over Van Buren's relative decadence, and again call him Van Ruin. Uh, Harrison became the first packaged presidential candidate. 
depicted as a simple soul from the backwoods. And his campaign deliberately avoided the discussion of national issues the American way, substituted political songs, partisan slogans, uh, and appropriate insignias. It was called the Log Cabin Campaign. Uh, they passed out miniature log cabins and jugs of hard cider were widely distributed <clears throat> to emphasize Harrison's frontier identification. <clears throat> okay. So this era, 1828 to 1854, is known for the rise of both parties, the Whigs and the Democrats, okay? Known as the second party system. <clears throat> and uh, William Henry Harrison defeats Democrat Van Buren in the election of 1840. As we'll see here, uh, Harrison uh, actually dies a month into his term. Uh, very, uh, almost an unbelievable story. While he gave his inaugurational speech, it was in a cold drizzle. He did not have a hat or a top coat on. And he caught a cold, and it got worse, and he ultimately passed away. Okay, this is, that is the end of Chapter 10.